quote-unquote 
master who, watching him from a distance, secretly wiped a tear away and said, This is amazing, this dog. The shape of him is splendid, and yet I cannot be certain whether he had the running speed to go with his beauty, or is just one of the kind of table dogs that gentlemen keep, and it is only for show that their masters care for them. This passage not only illustrates the affection between master and dog, but also implies that as early as Homeric times, dogs were, to some extent, kept for status. It is only to show that their masters care for them. This sounds a lot like some superficial dog show fanciers today, some 3,000 years later. Indeed, the ownership of particularly impressive dogs became a status symbol very early. Sometimes, however, the dogs were too impressive for their own good. The 5th century BC Athenian statesman Alcidabiades, known as much for his good looks and overweening pride as for his involvement in the disastrous Peloponnesian War, had a dog that was so handsome that Alcibiades reportedly had its tail cut off because the dog did. Over the centuries, the dog became an image of selfless love and undying faith, and the historian and art student will find innumerable representations through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, often with religious overtones of dogs that were obviously held in the highest esteem. Many of these dogs were used for hunting, but others were obviously kept as quote-unquote luxury pets, judging by their demeanor sizes and extravagant coats. The admiration of beautiful dogs was not limited to Europe. The Jesuit priest Giuseppe Castiglione went from Italy to China as a missionary in 1715 and eventually became a court painter. Famous under his Chinese name of, and forgive me, Ava, I'm going to butcher this, but Lang Xinying for exquisite Of Sopo Priory near 
had a small dog as a 
democracy everywhere. The French court of Louis XIV seems to have been swarming with toy spaniels and the ancestors of today's papillons, which were one of the king's most popular gifts to his female favorites. Louis was a great dog lover and had a separate room where he enjoyed feeding his own dogs, each from its own
she was assured was quote-unquote a great beauty and quote-unquote was the admiration of all beholders. He describes the dog's front legs as bowed, quote, leaving a peculiar pear-shaped opening between them, which I was informed was one of its points of beauty. He was told of the breeding of some of the dogs and noticed clusters of black leather collars adorned with brass rings and clasps and of those about me, I learned was to be the prize in a rat match coming up in the future event. According to Mayhew, he says, the dogs were standing on the different tables or tied to the legs of the forms or sleeping in their owner's arms or were in turn minutely criticized, their limbs being stretched out and their mouths looked into as if a dentist were examining their teeth. It is worth noting were obviously a major concern even for the owners of these pure working dogs. This chapter is titled Forerunners of Today's Shows. Almost imperceptibly, as the years passed and the rat killing matches came to be regarded as offensive, various fancy aspects of the little rat dogs became more important as the pups began offering a forerunner to quote unquote real dog shows. As early as 1834, a fancy toy dog show was advertised at the Elephant and Castle pub in London. It was probably more an exhibition than a competition, but with the rat pits falling into disrepute, the time was ripe for a change. A concern with specific confirmation points long before modern breed standards had been established is evident from a report published in Illustrated London News in 1851 from a dog show St. Giles, owned by one Charlie Astrop. At this place, a club is held by one of the rules of which each member is expected, in fact, we believe compelled, to bring a dog for show or sale as he thinks proper, thus ensuring a good show night, which is on a Tuesday evening. And here may be seen the most beautiful specimens of Spaniel, Italian Greyhound, and, of late years, the Isle of Skye Terriers. The show dog or fancy pets, as they are termed, are solely valued for beauty of their respective sort. The King Charles, that has now for many years stood as prime pet with ladies, ranks in estimation as he more or less exhibits the following perfection, smallness of size, symmetry as to proportions, richness of color, and length of ears. Spaniels are often to be seen at spaniel shows, for which a hundred and fifty pounds would not be not the property of gentlemen or men of large means either. The author offers of his opinion that the price these dogs are valued at is no doubt perfectly ridiculous, but adds that anyone wishing to learn what merit and recommendation these dogs have may see some of the choicest specimens at Astrop's. The illustration accompanying the article shows at least two dozen well-dressed gentlemen, some assembled around long tables on which are seated a number of toy spaniels. Other small dogs are held in the arms of the men, and several larger dogs can be seen in an enclosure on one side of the room. At least one of these shows distinct crayon type. Although toy spaniels were by far the most expensive, other breeds could fetch high prices, sometimes at public dog auctions, which in those days carried none of the stigma associated such as proceeding today. This was the case as late as 1936, when after King George V's death, his gun dogs were auctioned off at Aldridge's. In the 1880s, a well-known pointer, Eitfield Dick, was auctioned off for £145, and the average for a lot of six pointers was about £40 each. Sold for 
illustrates the changing times better than any words can, titled A Jimmy Shaw Canine Meeting, 1855, it shows a number of well-dressed, pipe-smoking gentlemen gathered at Shaw's pub, the Queen's Head Tavern, together with a dozen dogs, including seven, several Carried in a 
does the world really need both a Swedish lab bond and a Finnish lab bond? Neither breed exists in the United States, but if you pose that question to a Swede or a Finn, you may start a fight. The creation, the creation of new breeds continues today and is likely to persist for as long as man's fascination with the varying forms of all things canine remains. It is clear that the undeniably famous first show in exhibitions of fancy dogs of various kinds had been held well before that. There were the aforementioned various toy spaniel shows in the pubs of London, as well as a forerunner of today's Peterborough Hound Show, known to have been held regularly in Kent since the 1770s. This exhibition, held in the countryside, was a forum for the huntsmen to show off their young stock during the summer off-season. The agricultural societies, so for sheepdogs as well as other livestock, often as a part of a sheep rearing contest. Agricultural shows have continued to host dog classes into the present in both England and Australia. The first competitions. What was new at the historic show in Newcastle was real confirmation competition with an official announcement. Unpredictable. At these events, from the 
Just enjoy. 